apply uh, every board, every socket, every curtain, hallelujah, every dimension that God enforces in our life and we don't know why. He puts boundaries on us and we want to buck against those boundaries and we want to, we run into a brick wall and we keep trying to move it and God says, don't move it. You're, you're building me a quadesh. This is a miquadesh. It is a sanctuary. It is a holy place. Amen. Where I want to meet with you and I want to commune with you and it's, 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 it's what God's doing in our life. This whole process of what God is doing in our life is, is an equal measure of what He did with the nation of Israel when He said, build me a sanctuary. Build me. Let's, let's build us a life together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every socket is important. Every, every board, the colors of the fabric that I want to bring into your life, it has importance. Every person that God brings in your life Every circumstance that God allows in your life. Every detail of your life, He has a plan. Do you believe it today? I believe it. I believe it with everything that's in me. I I believe that Romans 8.28 is one of the deepest things that's written in Scriptures. And if we can lay hold of it and understand it, that all things are not good. And that promise is not to everybody. Everybody in the world, they'll say it. Well, you know, all things work together you know, for good. But there's some restrictions and limitations on that verse too. All things will work together in your life for the good. What God's working and what God's doing is good. The plan that He's got is good. The the work that He's doing in your life is excellent. But that doesn't mean that everything that you're going to go through can be termed good. Amen. But He he does have a plan. He does have a blueprint. Amen. And and there's things that He's going to do in our life, you know, to produce an effect in us. And there there was every detail, every vessel that was used in this tabernacle as we study the depths of this stuff I want you to see into your own life you know the plan of God the gospel of Jesus Christ God didn't God didn't God didn't just fling things out in the universe and however it landed that's the way it fell without purpose and without design the fact the fact that you're living in an age that it began in the 1800s uh, you know evolution even in the days of the Bible when the scriptures were written, the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. There's always been those who've denied God and it denied the, the existence of our Creator. But there is something powerfully important when you understand the work of God in your life as Creator. Master Builder. Master Designer. Oh my Lord, He's got a plan for you. And to acknowledge God in your life as Creator and to set Him apart And a distinctive place is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And to fear God is to know knowledge. Amen. And and, and to understand the holy God is is the greatest endeavor that any of us can ever embark on. And I thank God for His plan and I trust Him. And when they're standing around the throne of God in heaven, they're praising Him because He's Creator. And they're praising Him because He's Redeemer. And this act of Creator, plan, the planner, the designer, is seen in the building of the tabernacle and definitely the plan of redemption. And so when it's all over with, when it's all been said and done, you and I are going to be standing with the angels around the throne of God praising Him for Creator, for being Creator, and praising Him for being Redeemer. Is that right? We're going to worship Him forevermore. Amen. Because He has redeemed us and bought us out of every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every nation, and every people. And He is building us together. He's built, (laughs) oh Lord, Woo, Jesus have mercy, we are the building of God. You're a board, I'm a board, I'm a socket, I'm a pen, I don't know what I am. I don't know what you are. You may be a curtain, you know, you may be a gate post, I don't know what you are. You may be, you know, a a little cup, amen, that's shaped like an almond that sits on top of one of the the seven branches of the lampstand. Amen, my God, I don't know what you are, but praise God, you're a part of this. Amen, and you bring significance to the building. Amen, you bring significance to the body of Christ. And so find your place in the body of Christ and don't be afraid to be there. Don't be, if God's got you as a pin, if He's got you as a socket, you're holding something together. Amen, isn't that wonderful? Use me, Lord, use me, Lord. You know, you know and, and make me a golden vessel sitting up on the table. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You, you know, you, you, might, you might be a, a spoon. You might be a, a, a shovel that takes the ashes, you know, out from it. I don't know what your part may be, but it, it's all glorious. 
as we see in this study, every part has, has a significance. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I don't want to get you too bogged down. I think that we, yeah, this is kind of an introduction. We get going and show you the whole tabernacle compound. And it's, it's interesting facts that if you know it, amen, that you can um, share it with other people. Amen, that you can absolutely share it with other people. The tabernacle is precision. Well, you know, we want this thing bigger. Well, God said, I don't want it bigger. I don't want it bigger. I want it just like this. Measure it. He gave him an exact pattern, and he's got a pattern for our life. He's got instructions for our life, and we need to follow him. And we'll have people that will want to influence us to, you know, do it bigger, do it better. Amen. But let's follow God's way. Let's follow God's pattern, and we won't get in trouble. Any more? Any questions that you have? Yes. From from what I read in scriptures, they they are there. There is um, the the glimpses of what a cherubim looks like. Is there's different glimpses of different. There's seraphims and there's cherubims. There's different orders of angels. Of course, then you know there's some a couple of archangels that's mentioned, and there may be more than what's mentioned. The Bible scriptures just don't tell us, you know. But the 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 cherubim, you know, that Ezekiel saw was astounding. The cherubim that Ezekiel saw was uh, that they stood and had the appearance of a man. They had the stature and the appearance of a man. Of course, they had wings, but underneath their wings they had hands. Okay, so that's, that's one. So when you think about the height and the appearance of a man standing with wings, but yet also hands underneath the wings, that's powerful, isn't it? So they got, you know, you all know, wing, you know wings, but that just kind of... You know, they had, he had arms too. The angels had, the cherubims had arms. But what was unique and distinctive about Ezekiel's cherubim, he saw them, those that, that he described in chapter 1 and chapter 10 of the book of Ezekiel, that they stood. Let me see if I can get this right because you just kind of throw that out on, on me. But had, they had four faces. They didn't have four heads, but had four ha- faces. And it's kind of like this. And this side there's a face. This side there's a face. Right here there's a face, and on this side there's a face. And the face, that, that whatever face it is on the four sides, is looking always forward. The face that's here is not looking over here. That's what this side's for. And it's not looking over here. That's what this side's for. And then it's not turning around and looking back because that's what this is for. So that any given time, those cherubims can see in every direction. No blind spots. That's right, no blind spots. Now, they're, they're not all seen as far as just God, omnipotent and all-powerful. Uh, God is all seen. But this, these cherubims that were described had, had a view that two eyes drive me and you crazy sometimes, trying to take in all the information we see. What if you, double, what if you, you know, quadruple that and you got, you know, eyes in the back of your head, you know? <laughs> Literally, you know, that's where that came from. But we had the face of, the face of a man, the face of a man, uh, the face of an ox, the face of the eagle, and uh, the face of a lion. Now, if it, I, had it, I had it right on which side it was. I know the face of the man was frontward, facing this way. Of course, every direction was frontward. It didn't matter which way you were looking. It was a front vision because we take great pride in seeing things face to face. Those cherubim saw that. But it was uh, the face of a man was here, and it's, uh, the face of it went in a bear? Or what was it? Okay. Okay. That's the way it was the face of an eagle. So on every different direction, and pardon me for not knowing each one of them right now, it's just not on the top of my head. Not something I thought I was going to need this morning. But it's uh, so that is a unique. That's not always the vision that we get when we think of cherubim. But that that multi-dimensional viewpoint. But that is the description that Ezekiel gave that depth in-depth thing, and he called it a cherubim. So I don't have any reason to believe that's, that's the main description that we have of a cherubim. Now, seraphim, described in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, the main thing that we know about the seraphim is the fact that it said that they had six wings. They had six wings. They had uh, wings, two wings they covered their face, two wings they covered their feet, and the other two they used to fly with. And, that is the main, and they were fiery because the word seraphim means fiery. So we, we know that description from them being fiery. Angel order. Seraphim and cherubim are all angelic orders. 
mercy seat. The, the, the mercy seat is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, and the cherubims are on the lid. Of the, they're on the mercy seat, and they're looking, they're looking inward there. They're, they're facing one, one point of their face is looking inward. They're looking at the glory. Because the Shekinah glory of God is what dwelt between the wings of the cherubim. I mean, there was a cloud by day, fire by night. And it radiated and emanated up from the mercy seat. That's God's presence. And it was visibly seen throughout the camp of Israel. A fire uh, by night and a cloud by day. But the, the resting place of it was there at the ark, at the mercy seat. Just called it the mercy seat. Well, it was that was what God called it. God called it the mercy seat. It was the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant itself was a chest, and it uh, and, and you know within the chest and the mercy seat covered the Ark, and that's significant. We'll get into that. The significance, the main significance of that mercy seat covering the Ark is because that Ark contained the tables of stone, which is the Word of God, the commandments of God. That. Also, the rod of God, the authority of God, the power of God, and the provision of God. And every bit of that was covered with mercy. Because I'm going to tell you what, when people did gaze, open up the Ark of the Covenant, look inside at Beth Shemesh, and in 1 Samuel chapter 6, 50,701 50, people slain when they looked, gazing on it, lifted. They removed the mercy seat and looked in the Ark just by itself. And the raw word of God without covered, being covered by the mercy of God, the raw authority of God, that rod of God, power of God with no mercy. It, y'all, it's destructive. It, it's, it'll kill us. It destroys us because of sin. Because of sin. God, that's why God covered it with a mercy seat. Now, according to Webster's Dictionary, the mercy seat, the, the, the definition of the mercy seat. I was looking up the, the one time back in the past, looking up definitions for a throne. I was trying to get, and it is a, a, a seat, and, and it's usually covered with a canopy. A throne was usually covered in the olden times, usually covered with a canopy. It was an elevated place to sit, a seat of authority and power. And most kings, wherever they went, had a seat of power, authority that went with them. And when they would make judgments and make rulings, they would sit down on that seat and make their judgment and their ruling from that seat. And they would uh, make their decrees and their laws from that seat because that throne represented their power, represented their authority. And wherever they went, they, they, they went in the power and authority of their throne. You know what I'm saying? They, they went in the power and authority of that throne. If they sent a messenger, the messenger goes with the power and authority of the throne. Uh, and, and so the throne represents power. It represents, uh, you know, action and the decrees and the mandates. And so... I was trying to define all this. And the dictionary said to me, for an example, see mercy seat. For the definition of a throne, see mercy seat. I tell you, yeah, I like that. And I said, when the dictionary can make me shout. <laughs> Woo! I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's just you, uniquely, you know, my, my problem and everything like that. I think anybody who could read that ought to get some joy out of that. And I was just looking up words in the, in the dictionary about the throne, about a throne. And it said, for example, see mercy seat. And when the Hebrews tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace, that's just, a, that's just another way of saying mercy seat. The throne of mercy, the throne of grace. Amen. <laughs> My God, he sits on a throne of mercy. Even when God dwelled in the Old Testament among his people, when he habitated, he communed with them from a place of mercy. <laughs> his dealings with us, even when, when, when it don't seem to go our way, it's in mercy. Amen. Everything that flows from the throne, amen, is from a seat of mercy. My God, don't you praise him? Hallelujah for that. My Lord, I love this stuff. And we're going we to kind of we gonna wrap it up this morning. We're going to let your brain rest just a little bit. Um, and so, so we're going in the gate. And the significance, let me tell you this one more thing. There's only one gate, and there's no way out. <laughs> but the same way you came in. There's not an exit door to the side. You know, you're, there's one way in. Amen. There's only one way in and there's only one way out. And that was through the gate. And uh, you weren't getting in the gate if you weren't prepared to come into the gate. And, and, that's, and we're going, tonight we'll study about the outer court. We're going to deal with a lot of stuff within the outer court. 
and thank God for his, his grace and mercy. But what did Jesus say in John chapter 10? He said, I'm the door. Didn't he? Isn't he the door? He's the gate. Only one gate. All roads, Oprah, do not lead to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. All roads do not lead to God. You know, not trying to be facetious or lamblast anybody at all. But there's only one way to God. There's only one way to approach to God. Holy God, and that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. We're not, we're not, we're not going to know God outside of Jesus Christ. He's God. We know that. He's the gate. He's the door. He's the way in. And, and of course, I like the fact that the gate, it was wide enough for people to get in. It wasn't, it wasn't broad. I mean, when you consider the whole width was 30 feet. You know, I mean, 50 feet. No, 75 feet. <laughs> I'll get it right here in a minute. The whole thing was 75 feet. The gate was 30. So, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't so narrow that you and your offering couldn't get in, but neither was it so broad that it was stretched from end to end. There were boundaries. There were boundaries. And this, this is something that over and over speaks to me in studying the Scripture in the tabernacle is the boundaries that God set, the dimensions of everything. And there was, there was a beginning to it and an end to it. And, uh, y'all, this, this whole mentality we live in, anything goes, come as you are, that was ne- that's never in the Word of God. <laughs> Try that if you want to. I mean, he, he, sinners, yes, come. But you're still going to come God's way, right? I mean, yes, it, it is a very st- straight and narrow way. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. And, and, that, and that straight has to do with, you know, measurement. It has to do with measurement. It has to do with dimension. It, it has to do with something that's straight. And, and it's narrow. It's straight and it's narrow. There's a measurement to it. There's a distinct measurement to it and lines and boundaries. And, it's, and it is narrow. And, and when you study that word for narrow, it, it, it has that feel to it of single file. Not breast to breast, a whole bunch of us at one time, but single file. You know, you, you going in, you know, one step at a time, one foot in front of the other, single file. Now, we're connected, we're joined together. But, but you know, this, this ain't, you know, a million man march, so to speak. This is... One step at a time, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. And God showed this to me one time in a vision of, of myself and my church family that we, we had at the time. We're traveling down some in the mountains. We were up, way up in the mountains, and we were on some rocky ledges. I'm talking about there, there wasn't no room to be, you know, playing hopscotch and jumping around and walking around. We were in some very dangerous places we were on ledges circling around a mountain that we could look down on the clouds this is how high up we were and we were together and we were tied together we were roped together and chained together we were connected together around our waist and 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 uh we had from our waist to ourself our arms we had room to move our arms but we were tied to ourselves as well i don't know how to explain that and we were tied to one another because i'm going to tell you what there wasn't hardly there wasn't hardly room but to walk, you know, one step at a time, paying attention to what we're doing, one foot in front of the other. You, you better watch where you're walking. And I mean, that you had to. And, and we were single file. And there was a sister that was in our church, and she, um, she looked over the, uh, she got close to the edge, and she's looking over the edge, and it kind of gave way there, right where her foot was. And she slipped, and she fell. And when she slipped and fell, of course, it yanked a few other people down with her. That didn't go that far because the rest of us, you know, thankfully the rest of us had some footing that everybody didn't fall over the edge. And they weren't lost because we were tied together, but they did fall over the edge. But I'm going to tell you what, it was terrifying. That dream was one of the most terrifying dreams that I ever had of how serious this thing is because we are tied together. We are tied together. If someone goes over the edge, some of us are going with them. And, and it, we... There was a potential there for every one of us to have been destroyed. If some of us hadn't had better footing, if those that, who, who didn't get pulled over the edge hadn't had better footing, we could all have been lost. Amen. But praise the Lord. Yes, the gate is important. We're going in one gate, one way to God. I mean, one foundation, Jesus Christ. And this is what Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is trying to say to those Jews. He's better. You've got to understand, He fulfilled all this, making Him better. Better covenant, better promises, better hope, better sacrifice, better priesthood. Glory to God, better tabernacle. Glory to God. Let's, let's uh, stand our feet this morning. Amen. And praise the Lord. We thank God for what he's doing. And
Sister Janie, you can stop the DVD if you want to, but let's just worship the Lord just a little bit this morning. Don't you praise Him? Uh, I, I, I hope it's it's been a little.